there were things that could have that happened to this church that could have broken the church. Uh, more than one thing: um, transitioning, building plans, pastoral transitions. The Newark Road property caught on fire. I mean, there were several things that could have broken the church. But I feel like that we, we that there was a core group of people who just held tight and God pulled us through each of those things. And there was always something that came, that, that big part of the pie chart where we, we just wrote God, that always, something always happened. It may not have been what we thought was going to happen or what we wanted to happen, but something always happened to fill up that chart. I'm Jay Mahan, and uh, I've been attending New Life for over 25 years. I'm Troy. This is my lovely bride, Krista. We've been here at New Life uh, roughly 25 years. I've been the pastor for 22-ish years. I am Peggy Wise, and I've been coming to this church for over 30 years. I'm Mandy Downs, and I've been at New Life for 18 years. I'm Eric Browning. Um, my wife, Crystal, and I, we have been attending New Life for about 34 years regularly. I'm Tom Duncan, and I've been at New Life for just over 16 years. Fairly early on, going to New Life uh, is called Evangelical Church in Nazarene back then. It was, um, it was just different, if I'm honest, where I was at that point in my life. Um, going to church was not a high priority for me. Um, and so it was, it actually was a, a really kind of easy place to kind of get back into church. That first Sunday felt different than other churches that we had visited because everyone was real. It felt like people weren't trying to put on a show, but they were trying to really, truly just authentically follow Jesus. And it was nothing for a Sunday morning for the town alcoholic to walk in or some of our uh, church members to bring somebody that they had passed on the street and bring them into church with them. Culturally, it fit who I was. You know, it's not like you had to dress different to come into church or whatever versus how you dress throughout the week or whatever. It was just very down to earth. I felt like there was purpose to new life and that, that caught me and um, made me feel like, okay, this is a place to minister, this is a place to do things, um, this is a, a place to be a part of something. Uh, before I started pastoring here, I was on the board at one point, probably a horrible board member. I put in some nursery time, um, and occasionally the former pastor would have me fill in and speak for him. You know, and I did that every blue moon. Gradually, as my kids grew up through the nursery and then through preschool and then through kid life, I just kind of graduated in my volunteering with um, whatever level that we're at, except they graduated from kid life and I never did. I was on the church board fairly quickly, and uh, we used to joke that it felt like the youth group was running the church um, because here we were, the, the whole board was made up of, of a lot of people in their late 20s and uh, like how did this happen? <laughs> it was small enough everybody needed to do something and everybody was willing to do something. Boy thinking back on how I felt when Troy became pastor it took a while to mentally wrap our heads around the idea and then to accept it um, at first um, but obviously the through the years there is no denying that he was exactly the right person at exactly the right time. I was working at Mount Vernon Nazarene University as the assistant director of recruitment at the time. That was my first notification. Someone had called me and said, hey, you know, there's some folks that want to consider you for the next pastor. I came home and told Krista and I was just, my head was spinning, literally. I was just like, what do I do with this, you know? I do remember us praying about it and just putting it in the Lord's hands and saying, you know, we trust you if this is where we're supposed to be. I came in with not knowing much at all about pastoring. Uh, I believe that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shine and that we 
desperately and passionately need to be reaching people and not just from an eternal perspective but it, following Christ is the greatest way to live right here right now and there's just so many people who are broken we've all got our brokenness but man to come into a place like this so I was determined to do whatever I had to to move this thing forward and I was also going to make whatever decisions I had to make to allow that to happen I made a lot of phone calls to pastors and friends who had much more experience than I did and I don't know how many times I'd go here's what I'm dealing with how do I how would you handle this you know one time as we were growing I was standing out by the church dumpster for some reason throwing something in there and I was looking back at that little building on Newark Road and it's just like God spoke to my spirit and said there's gonna be more than than this and of course I didn't know what he was talking about at the time um, but it was just if if we're gonna do this, let's do it. When we were on Newark Road, we were this family that wanted to come to keep coming together to just reach as many people as we could. Yeah, having church on Newark Road, um, it, it was it was exciting. Um, you know, new people were coming in all the time, um, but boy, we just we just ran out of space. We, we did one service, um, then we kept growing, had to go to two services on Sunday morning. Because one of the things from day one for me is we will always have space to reach more people, whatever we gotta do. I remember we had to um, take the pews out and, and put chairs in because there weren't enough seats with the pews. And we were like, okay, we're gonna take the pews out. and no one batted an eye. Everyone was like, well, yeah, because if that means we can get this many people sitting in this auditorium hearing the message of hope in Jesus, then we're gonna take the pews out. I forget what kind of ministry team I was on, but for some reason I was in the lobby and the parking lot was just full. I mean, unbelievably full. And I watched a car come in and they drove around the parking lot and there was there was nowhere to park. And that, that car just rolled around the parking lot, they looked around and they just, they drove out. We just didn't have enough room. I mean, people had stopped coming. They wanted to come, they came to the parking lot or they would come and stand in the back. And at some point they just, they would leave because there was no place to park, no place to sit. You know, Troy has always said this, it's always about the next hundred people. It's like the most important people aren't here yet, right? Uh, you know, there are thousands and thousands of unchurched people in Knox County, and they're not here yet. We went to two services, then we were still growing beyond that, and so just sat around the table with the leadership team exploring all options. Well, I think the decision to go to the high school was like, all right, we have to do something, here's our option and then figuring out how it was gonna work came later. Church at the high school for just under four years was a really great experience as you look back on it. I'm sure in the middle of it, there was times it felt hard. Everyone knew it was a transition to something else. We just didn't know what that something else was yet. And we knew we had to, had to be there because um, of the growth, because people kept coming. Troy then came to the board and said, I really need someone who would uh, be in charge of, of getting all of this from here to there and coordinating all of that. I just had this sense that something was coming when we did that. Um, I don't know whether God was trying to tell me something or I just knew, I just, I, I knew this was coming and it wasn't but a week. It said, Jay, I think, I think you're that guy. Uh, we ended up with a, a 1994 uh, two-wheel drive Chevy pickup and a car trailer, uh, like a racing trailer where you'd load the car in one side and then there'd be tools in the other and had a little, it was a big, big trailer. We got gig boxes for the speakers and the soundboard and we had stacks and stacks and stacks of little uh, chairs. We had a whole nursery I mean, everything you needed in the nursery was all in totes. 
I mean, and all, it was all a learning process. I mean, we started out with most of the wrong gear, and we had to we had to learn and, and find stuff that worked. And we called ourselves after we kind of got this going, called ourselves the Tabernacle Team because you know, <laughs> man, they they come on that trailer and they would pull stuff and push pull pick stuff up and put it on their shoulders. And I I thought. You know, this is like the Old Testament, when they carried the church on their shoulders. When we transitioned to the high school, I remember just thinking, are people seriously gonna bring their kids to, to the middle of the, the hallway? And there was a little bit where the, the Lord just had to say, Mandy, they're, doesn't, they're not coming because of that, they're coming because of me. Um, the kids came in and they sat down and we started to worship and I just went, God, you're right. It doesn't matter where we are. God did such good things there. And so many people came when they were in that, we were in the high school because it wasn't a church. You know, pretty soon we're, the auditorium is filling up at the high school and so um, it just, it's been like a, a snowball sometimes. It just built momentum and built momentum and just kept going. I was really nervous about here I am with hundreds of people and no place to go. Like there was no safety net. All we knew was that we needed more space and so we went to the high school and I just remember sitting there going, I have no clue what's next, but God was in it and God opened up the doors for what was next. Just a flat out miracle. Uh, when the 84 lumber property came open, one of our guys, uh, Dave Hurlbutt was over here at 84 lumber buying some screws or something. And I get a call from him going, hey, 84 lumber's going out of business over there. Their property's going up for sale. I can remember none of us kind of thought it was actually gonna happen with the offer that we were providing to 84 Lumber. And when it did, I think it just it surprised everybody. Two weeks later, they were handing us the keys. That's commercial property. On top of that, it's a church. So we had to have, you know, of course, a board vote. Then there had to be a, um, a district approval. Then there had to be a church vote. And there was just all of this stuff. And it was just like two weeks of craziness, but it was just so obvious that God had it. It took us two weeks to buy a lumber yard, but it took us a long time to turn a lumber yard into a church. To say there was so much that needed done um, was an understatement and a half. We'd have board meetings where we talk about, well, we're getting, we have this much money for this and we have this much money for that. And then there'd be a spot on the pie chart and we'd write God and we'd point to the pie chart. It's like, we have no idea where this money is coming from. We walked through all the buildings and around the property and I will never forget standing there in what is now the Teen Life Center and praying and trusting that God would do his thing. Uh, fortunately, we had um, some really key people in the church at that point. I think of Aaron Kester, who just had uh, a great, not just sense of what needed done, but ability to, to get things done. And so we just right away started having work days. It was a lot to get it down to the shell that we could then start to make it into something workable. I just remember as we started working on the 84 Lumber property, it seemed like it didn't matter what night you would stop by the church, there was gonna be somebody here working. It just solidified us as a group, and not just as, as a group of people, but it, it helped us as individuals just see God at work and to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. Even on days that we were here working and things, um, I think most people were spending that time really praying that the effort that was put in, um, God was going to use in a way to, to bring about exactly what He wanted in this property. 
I have seen God work in so many ways here since we moved into this building. Anything from physical stuff, um, it was a few years ago we were able to purchase the storage unit property next door which we desperately needed if we were going to do anything else because we were out of parking. We couldn't, even if we had all the money to build and expand, we didn't have the parking and so that was a miracle. So there were lots of those types of miracles but then just the life change that has happened and continues to happen in people. Every week we're hearing stories of people who said, I've never been able to go to church before because I've always felt like an outcast. Or we hear kids say things like, you know, I'm, I'm going through this and so I didn't think that Jesus could even love me because of what's happened to me. I love Psalm 127, I think it's verse one, where it talks about, you know, we labor, um, but God's the one that builds the house. We need you healing marriages and healing bodies and healing people spiritually and helping people step across the line of faith. And he has just done that time and time and time and time again. Somebody once said, you know, if your church all of a sudden disappeared, out of your community, would the community really, truly miss your church? And we're doing everything in our power to go, I think they would. I think they would miss us on several levels. And so this is another opportunity to where before this building, before these parking spaces, before any of this is ever a church to someone in our community, it's where their kid goes to play ball. It's where the Girl Scout troop meets. It's going to be something else first that will then tear down the walls and barriers where we can build relationships and we can connect and we can invite. My ultimate hope is not that they would start coming to new life. My ultimate hope is that they would find Christ. Whether they darken the doors of this facility as a church or not ever, it's our job to, to spread the seed and to cast the seed and to plant the seed and to water and to sow. And, and so that's what we want to do, whether they ever see this as their church home or not. That is what I think is so cool about this church is it's really not about a building or about a space or about um, the walls. It's about the people and the fact that God is moving in this church and he is here and he helps us through marriage troubles and raising kids and job struggles and family, extended family struggles. I'm speaking personally, um, you know, and, and losing family members and how hard that is. And the fact that, that this family, it wasn't the walls that made me feel comfortable. It wasn't the chairs. It wasn't the space that made me feel comfortable. It's the family that, that came around me and supported me. I think that is a perfect description of who New Life is. And that's the reason why I'm still here after 18 years is because we're a group of people that says what God wants is more important than what I want. And that nothing is more important than bringing hope in Jesus to the people around us.